At this point, if you're planning to follow along with the video, I suggest that in the BRFSS website, you download the SAS transport, for, transport format of the BRFS data. You could also, if you wanted to, download the ASCII data, um, but it's a little bit easier to open up the SAS data. So you should download that file. It takes a moment. Once you've downloaded it, take note of where you've downloaded it. You need to know the file path. And also take a moment to unzip that file so that you actually have access to the, the SAS transport file, which should have XPT as its extension. Often people who are using R um, will use the workspace idea in order to organize their work. The workspace is the set of um, the set of objects that are currently available to you in R. So every time you create an object, a vector, a matrix, you're creating a new object within your workspace. What I usually do is I clear my workspace before I'm beginning um, some new project, and then I add things to it so that the workspace doesn't become overloaded with large data sets, which could um, cause things to slow down or crash. Um, what some people do is save a different workspace for each project that they're working on. The easiest way to do that is with this workspace menu. I don't do that. What I try to do is keep my workspace clear and have um, reproducible code to um, very quickly reproduce and, and, um, any files that I've created, any objects I've created um, during my previous work on a project. So I don't deal with workspaces in my own work except to clear it and make sure I have reproducible code. But you can feel free to um, play around with, with the possibility of using workspaces if you like. In order to access my data set, I'm going to have to make sure I know the file path. And in order to come up with the right file path, I have to know my working directory. The working directory is the folder that R thinks you're in right now, that you're going to navigate from. And one way to find out what working directory I'm in right now is to run this get working directory command. And you can see right now, um, I'm in my main user folder. So cputniac is a folder that contains within it the downloads folder, the documents folder, the Dropbox folder, etc. That means that anything else I say about my file path should start with something that's within this cputniac folder, such as downloads or documents or Dropbox. Now I have a few options. If I wanted to, I could set my working directory using either the menus or this command right here. So for example, if I'm planning to place my files uh, related to this project in the documents folder, I can run this command set working directory documents and now I only have to refer to um, the part of the file path that's after the word documents. I'm going to show you a different idea here because um, it's a good time to introduce it. What I'm going to do instead is create an object in R that is equal to this string. So I'm running this command right here. All I'm doing is making an object in R called file path that consists of the word documents followed by a backslash. Why am I doing that? Well, because now anytime I want to um, refer to a file path, I can paste together this file path with the rest of my um, the rest of, of the names of my files. This can be helpful if within a particular work session uh, you might be um, storing documents in multiple different file paths, then you can make a couple different versions of this file path variable. This can also be helpful if you're going to be working on something in multiple computers. You can, instead of changing your working directory each time, have a couple different versions of the file path um, and just change it each time. So let's take a moment to talk about this paste command. Paste is a command that literally pastes together strings. So here's the string hi. Here's the string, how are you? And if I run the command paste, hi and how are you, I get one string, hi, how are you? By default, the paste command will put a space between those two strings. But I could also change the default. So if I say sep equals and then a comma, now it's going to use a comma instead of a space to separate hi and how are you. If I don't want any space at all between hi or how are you, I could say sep equals and then put quotes with nothing in between, and now there's no space at all between hi and how are you. This paste command can be helpful in multiple ways, but in particular it will be helpful as we use this um, file path idea. Now we'd like to open the BRFSS dataset. R can open data in a lot of different formats. Often the best thing to do is to get it into CSV format in some way. So if you have data that looks like an Excel spreadsheet to you, you can often save it as a CSV file, a comma separated values file, uh, which is the easiest thing to read into R using the command read.csv. So if you're going to do that, and I have a comment about it right here in this uh, code file, just make sure that you've deleted from the Excel file, especially the column names, um, any symbols that have meaning in R because that will cause errors. If your data is in a format that's intended for some other statistical software like Stata or SPSS or SAS or Jump, often you can open the data set within that other software and then export it as CSV and then read it into R. So that's often the easiest thing to do. That's usually what I do. 
There's another option, and it's actually the option that we're going to use uh, right here today, which is to download a package that directly reads these files into R. So if you're using a data set intended for Stata or SPSS or SAS, you can usually find a package that has um, you know, a read.stata or read.spss command. Um, there's a couple of them out there that will directly open those files into R. Again, I usually just export a CSV because I, I feel more comfortable with that command. Sometimes your data might come um, in a text document, perhaps with tabs or commas or spaces in between, and you may find the read that table and read the lim commands helpful in those cases, and you can look at the help pages to understand how best to use those. So all that said, here's the easiest way to open the BRFSS data. I downloaded the data, and you should download the data in the SAS format. Remember, there were two choices, but I suggest using the SAS format. And then I'm going to use a package that's appropriate for this particular SAS format. How did I find this package? What I did is I googled how to open BRFSS in R, which is something you can do if you're using a large publicly available data set. And I found that many people had already discussed the best way to get this particular data set open in R, and this is what they suggested. So that is a, a winning strategy. Um, but you can also just Google how do I you know, open files of this particular type, and often you'll find people discussing that. So if you're following along, you can run this line to install packages. Remember that when you install a package, you only have to run this line one time ever on your computer, but then every time you're, you're, using, um, you're using a particular code file, you need to use library to tell R that you're ready to use this package right away. Now that we've done that, um, I unzipped my file and I have um, this file path. And you should look at what the name of the file is on your computer. It might be capital XPT or the file might have ended up called something else. What am I doing right here? I'm using this paste command that we just discussed. I'm pasting together the string that is my file path. Remember this documents string right here. So I'm pasting together document slash together with the name of the file, including its extension. And I'm saying sep equals nothing. In other words, I'm creating this string right here. And that is my the file path that I wanted. So I'm reading in the brfss with the command read.export, which is a command from this package. And I'm setting file equal to the result of this paste command. And what I'll do in this file, um, in, this, in this video, is any time I want to read in a file, I'm going to paste together the file path with the file name, which means that I could very easily change that file path um, in the future, which would be a nice thing to be able to do. So I, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to run the code right now because I did already, and it took five minutes. Now, depending on how fast your computer is, there may be a different amount of time it takes to open the BRFSS. Um, it's a very large data set. It's between 400 and 500,000 rows in it. Now, some people will tell you that's not a large data set, so it's all about, it's all about context, but it's, it's large um, compared to what you have probably seen in uh, intro stats classes. Um, so you can read in that and then go get a drink of water, wait five minutes. Once you've done that, you should be able to confirm that the BRFSS has 4,600, 4,6464 rows and 283 columns. Note that um, not for read.export, but for other commands like read.csv that open data, you sometimes have the option to read in a subset of the data, which can be a good option if the data is just unwieldy. So for example, suppose I had a CSV file containing this data. I don't, but suppose that I did. Um, when you have CSV, you usually want to say header equals true to make sure the the R knows that the first row consists of variable names. That's not an issue with the, um, the SAS export version, but with CSV, you want to make sure that's true. And then here, I can tell R how many rows I want to read in, and also whether I want to skip any of the initial rows. So this line, as I've written it here, will read in um, rows 200,001 through 300,000, um, which can be nice if the data set is just too big to handle. Another thing you can do if the data set feels too big to handle is save the resulting data set as an R object, which is often smaller and easier to store uh, than the original data set. And so once I have an R object called BRFSS, or any time you have an R object that took you a while to create, you can save it. You take the save command, and the first argument is the name of the object, and the second argument is where you'd like to put it. So I'm saying that the file should be put in um, the following place. Remember that the output of this paste command looks like this document slash, and here I didn't say sep equals nothing, and I should do that, so let's change it. If I say sep equals nothing, right here, then this paste command produces this string, and this is a file name I just made up just now. It does not have to be the same as the name of the object. In fact, I encourage you to make it a different name. Um, and if I run this line of code right now, 
what's going to happen is that a file that wasn't there before called the brfss file.r is going to appear in my documents folder. Um, and that is a good thing because later I could load that file back again. Um, you're seeing it's taking a moment because the data set is really big and that's okay. It's still going to be probably quicker to reload this data set. So suppose that after I worked with this data set for a while, I cleared my workspace and I didn't have this um, data set open anymore. If I wanted to bring it back, one way to do that would be to type in load and then file equals the same file path I have over here. And then all of a sudden I would have an object called brfss in my workspace once again. Let's just check that that, um, that is true, that I do indeed in my documents folder. Um, I have this file now. There it is, the brfss file. So that has indeed appeared just now, which is great. Uh, one thing to know is that R will not give you any kind of error if you try to rewrite something. So suppose I actually had, you know, really important information stored in the brfss file.r, I would have just written over it. So you do need to be careful with that. Now we're going to get into data cleaning. And a former student who took the QAI summer course in 2013 came across a particular uh, variable in the BRFSS data set that I think is just a really good example of why data cleaning is really, really important. So what we're going to do first is look at the code book um, for this particular variable. So I'm just going to search um, for the blood sugar variable. And here it is. Okay, so I found the variable name blood sugar. And let's look at this. So the, the description of the variable about how often do you check your blood for glucose or sugar? Include times when checked by a family member or friend, but do not include times when checked by a health professional. So we're interested in, for people who have diabetes, presumably, how often they're checking their blood, glucose, or sugar. Now let's look at the summary here. So let's go from the bottom. For some people, this variable will be left blank. That means they weren't asked or the data is missing. So that suggests, for example, that maybe the previous question showed these people don't have diabetes, so they weren't asked the question. And indeed, when you look at the frequency, you can see that most of the people in the data set were uh, not asked this question, which makes sense because most of the people in the data set did not have diabetes. The people who have 999 um, written as their, as their response to this question refused to answer. So 62 people like that. The people of 888 said that they never checked their blood sugar. Now, to me, that 888 should actually be maybe a zero, right? Those are people who check their blood sugar zero times. That's very different than refusing to ask, answer a question about your blood sugar. People who have 777 recorded don't know or aren't sure how many times they check their blood sugar. So clearly these numbers, 777, 888, and 999, shouldn't be taken at face value. Those are not numbers that we should average together. In addition to that, it looks as if and we can see that it is true that the people who were responding to this question were allowed to tell the interviewer how many times they check their blood sugar each day, or they could tell them each week or each month or each year. They had four different choices. Um, probably what happened is they just responded and then the person interviewing had to decide how to code it down. So here's how the BRFSS decided to code this data. If the person responded in terms of time per day, they wrote down a three digit number that began with the number one, and then ended with the number of times per day. So for example, if I said I check my blood sugar three times a day, they're going to enter the number 103. If you answer the question in terms of number of times per week, they write down a three digit number beginning with the number two. So if I check my blood sugar three times a week, it's going to say 203. For times per month, it's going to be a three digit number beginning with three. And so if I check my blood sugar three times per month, it'll be 303. And if I say three times per year, they're going to write down 403. So the result is that the values in this variable are not at all useful for numerical analysis, even though they're recorded as numbers. If we go back to the data set, we can indeed see that. If I summarize this variable, this is a mess. This mean of 246 has nothing to do with how many times people have, um, how many times people have um, checked their blood sugar. That's really not a meaningful number. There's a lot of cleaning to do before this is a meaningful variable. One thing that is meaningful here is that when you use the summary um, for a particular variable, it'll tell you how many NAs there are. So that's good to know that that's the number of NAs that I have. Um, you can also check it this way. The command is.na um, will give will take a variable and turn it into yes or no, true or false, for whether each value is NA. And if you make a table of those, you can see um, for how many times you had true versus false. So the is.na um, value can be very helpful if the um, missing values in your data set are already um, recorded as NA. If not, that's something you actually have to deal with. So for example, if there are blanks in your data set um, that ended up as blank strings instead of NAs, you need to turn them into NAs so that R will know they're missing. There's a video on this site 
um, called R Extras that talks a lot more about exactly how to deal with those different kinds of missing values that I, I recommend you watch. So just like this summary is not helpful, a histogram is also not meaningful. This, this histogram here is not giving us any useful information about how often people are checking their blood sugar. We can look at a table of values. I'm going to close the histogram here. So here now we're seeing, okay, how many people said 101, which means, month, which means once a day? 6,606 people said they check their blood sugar once per day. Okay, so that's, that's good to know that, that the real response, right, and a lot of people chose that response. So similarly, you know, here are a bunch of different values that people gave as their answer along with how often people actually gave those answers. So you can see the patterns here. For the three-digit numbers that start with one, um, the, highest, the highest frequencies go with the smaller numbers all the way to three people who said they check their blood sugar 99 times per day. That's perhaps not a real value. We should worry about that. Then we get to people who gave in terms of number of times per week. We have a lot of people who said once per week, and then the numbers go down as we get across the 200s um, for people who gave the responses in terms of times per week. So we can see here what the pattern is, but what our goal is is to turn this variable into something we can actually take the mean of. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new variable in the data set. If I just wanted to create a new vector, I could just have on the left side of this arrow times per year. But what I actually want to do is make sure this variable is part of the data set. So I'm going to put in the left side of the arrow BRFSS dollar sign times per year, and this variable will be created as a variable in the data set. I'm going to start by making a blank variable. So the rep command um, is going to repeat the NA symbol, the blank symbol, how many times? Well, however many times there are rows in my data set. So this is just going to add a blank column to my data set. And I want to first deal with the people whose blood sugars were equal to values were equal to 777 or 999 because if you remember, those are the people who didn't know or refused to answer. Um, and I want to make sure that times per year stays NA for those people. Now I could have omitted these lines because by default I've made times per year equal to NA before I change it to anything else, but I'm putting it here on these lines here so you can see how I'm going to explicitly fill in the values of times per year um, based on the, the values of the other variables. So this right here, BRFSS blood sugar equals equals 777. What I've highlighted here turns into a vector of trues and falses indicating when blood sugar was recorded as 777. Remember that the hard brackets mean where. So here I'm saying times per year, the times per year variable where the blood sugar variable is 777 should be recorded as NA. Similarly, the times per year variable where the blood sugar variable is equal to 999 should be recorded as NA. So that's important. And I'll run these even though, again, it won't change anything because all the values of times per year were initially set to NA. However, I want to make sure that I don't lose track of which people had 777s and 999s as opposed to missing. Because there is something qualitatively different about someone who does have diabetes and was asked how often they, che they check their blood sugar and just didn't know or refused to answer. That's kind of important. That tells you something about that person as opposed to someone who doesn't have diabetes and therefore wasn't asked. So one thing um, that you can do is create a new variable, and I'll add to this one to make it more helpful. You can create a new variable, for example, don't know or refused, and I'll create this variable right in the data set, and I'm going to use the if else command, um, which is a command I really like. What this command does is it takes as its first argument a vector of trues and falses, its second argument what you want to input when you have a true, and this, the third argument, what you want to input when you have a false. In other words, this highlighted part right here asks the question, was the blood sugar equal to 77 or was the 777 or was the blood sugar equal to 999? If yes, this new variable will be set equal to 1, otherwise 0. And so if we create this variable and we summarize it, we see that there are still a lot of NAs, which is good that the NAs were maintained, right? These are the people who weren't asked the question at all. Um, the mean of this variable is zero. In other words, it rounds to zero. There weren't a lot of people um, who had blood sugar equal to 777 or 999. But if we make a table of this variable, often looking at a table versus a summary gives different information. Um, the summary gives the mean, the table doesn't. But the summary tells you how many NAs there are, and the table omits that information. Um, but here you can see that of the whole data set, 392 people who were actually asked the question didn't know or refused to answer. So it's good to create another variable that differentiates between um, values that you're combining together. And in this case, I'm combining together the don't know or refused with the didn't even, wasn't even asked. Um, but I'm, I'm also creating this variable so that I can um, keep track of that if I want it later.